Yes, yes, I heard you. The LG CX48. This is the 48 inch version. I've already got it on the wall, so it must be pretty good, right? No, no, it's a, it's a terrible curse. I mean, it's good. It's so good. Everything it's good at, it's so good at it. Good. But there's also bad things. It's bad at the bad things. And so, I don't know. The story of Icarus flying too close to the sun and his wings melt? It does get pretty warm. Let's take a deep dive. LTT store dot no no store dot level one text com we have we have hoodies too I lost my jacket I, it's it's a long story I don't know what happened it's probably fine anyway so this is an OLED display and I want to stop for a second and talk about OLED displays but we're going to talk about this display in particular and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the HDR capability and it's 120 hertz variable refresh rate and the things that make it great, like the OLED-ness of the panel. I've also got a Ryzen Pro 4750G for the bonus round, so we can take a look at this thing and see how it does with our test system. Tested it on 6800, this is the Sapphire Nitro Plus. It's quite a good implementation of no big Navi, you know, Navi 2. And I've also got our MSI Supreme 3090. Now, NVIDIA was first on the scene with support and to be sure, because this is HDMI, it's brand new, there are bugs. There are a lot of bugs. There are an insane number of bugs. There are also firmware issues with this display, and we'll get to all of that. So first, you know, the holy grail of display technology is something like OLED. You see, most traditional LCD screens have a light source in them of some kind. It used to be, you know, compact, um, cold cathode tubes, basically tiny fluorescent lights, many, 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 many layers of plastic, um, a thin film transistor, and later in-plane switching type technology. And, and so basically the LCD screen itself would be the different colors that it needed to be, or there were various color filters that would make a particular layer a color, but there was one source of light. And then there's also this kind of like, since LED technology's gotten kind of awesome, there's also this technology where, you know, you put a grid of like 64, 128 white LEDs behind that panel. If you've ever seen an old school overhead projector, like, you know, uh, what you would have like in a college or a lecture hall or grade school or whatever, um, you put a transparency on and then there's a light, a bright light that shines in a lens and it, and it projects it. It's kind of like all that, except with the, without the lens. But I'm getting kind of off topic here. OLED, so each pixel here, actually technically each sub-pixel is a light emitting diode. It's its own separate element. So there's not a single source of light or a collection of source of lights or a grid of like 128 or 256 LEDs. No, there's 3840 times 2160 times three plus some more pixels in this panel for a 4K resolution because they're actual sources of light that turn on and off, we don't have to rely on a liquid crystal to change. Liquid crystal is completely out the window. Uh, the problem is that, well, this is a 48. This is the smallest display that you can get, one. It's hard to ma manufacture them. Um, but this is actually a fourth or fifth generation OLED panel, so they've gotten really good. A lot of phones, especially higher end phones, will use an OLED display because your phone is not on as much as a computer monitor. But because each individual pixel is its own light source, that changes over time, depending on how much that pixel is on. Actually, the subcomponents of it do. Red, green, and blue, those are the three colors that are used to actually reproduce an image for each individual pixel. And if you have a particular pixel that happens to have blue on a lot of the time, that blue LED is going to become dimmer over time. It's called burn-in. So there's a full resource that I'm gonna recommend outside of level one, I know. There's a lot of really good resources on OLED once you sort of, you know, get your, uh, <laughs> get your base level knowledge down and you know what the terminology is and you, you have sort of a mental picture of how the technology works. Artings, Artings ratings, artings.com. It's an incredible resource where they're doing super, super long-term testing. This, to be sure, is more TV than monitor. And I know we've reviewed some big monitors, big monitors from Asus, 
from Acer, the, the Korean imports. This actually replaces the Korean crossover 55 inch monitor that Level 1 imported, gosh, when, when Level 1 started. And those are, you know, sort of traditional LCD manufacturing. The difference here is that historically OLED was like $5,000. This is a panel that's approximately $1,000, $1,200, something like that uh, for the 48 inch version. So this is more in like disposable territory. If you use this hot and heavy, it is gonna burn in. It's gonna retain after images. It's like the old school plasma displays, remember those? Those were kinda also their own light source, but you couldn't make the pixels very small on those either. So with this, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. There's a lot of upsides with each individual pixel being its own light source other than burn-in. So if you, if you discount burn-in, uh, it's basically as fast as the microprocessor inside the monitor can handle. And so we did latency testing, and the latency testing is really darn good. Although, in order to get it to be really darn good, you basically have to change every single setting in the menu because it comes out of the box designed to be a TV. So you have to turn on game mode, you have to turn on ultra deep color, which is really just the same color depth that it's been since, um, I don't know, VGA, analog VGA. Analog VGA was like 24-bit color. Look at this amazing thing. And then it was the year 2000. Well, that's called ultra deep color because we only just now got back to that level of technology. Okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it is ridiculous. Ultra deep color is just uh, something more toward like what you would expect from a PC monitor because up till now, TVs have been crap. And well, up till about 10 years ago, TVs were crap and they couldn't really display a lot of colors. And that's why, you know, colors of different TVs look different. But sometimes commercial TVs would actually have um, better performance characteristics for being on 24 seven in your favorite restaurant. And so th that panel type would get used commercially. But again, let's focus on the actual LED TV. Uh, the other thing is, you know, firmware, as I mentioned. So there's software that runs on this thing, it's a smart TV. It's definitely doing a lot of things. I don't think we can trust LG to have this thing plugged in all the time because it does have Alexa integration and a smart speaker and all this other stuff. I have disabled all of that through the menu. You don't have to do anything special to do that. Uh, but it does have to be plugged in or connected wirelessly in order to download firmware updates. I'd recommend that you wire it in just in case it remembers your wireless MAC address or something like that to try to be like, oh, this TV's physically located here. Uh, the problem is that uh, the firmware, um, as of like, I've had this TV for a while, but I have another review because literally every firmware update has changed the TV in some significant way. Um, the most recent fixes fixed HDMI 2.1. NVIDIA and LG sort of came together and fixed the HDMI interface. And that is a whole complete ball of crazy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. One of the thought process, processes in my head is like, is this display so good that if I could use it at two or three years, like get two or three useful years out of it, even though it's murdering itself as I use it, is it so good that I don't care, that I'll just buy another one in two or three years, or maybe the price is gonna come down, are we, are, is that where we are? That's the thought process you should have. It's like, can I spend $1,000 on this to use as a monitor, and if I only get two or three years out of it, of, you know, six, eight hours a day of productivity, am I okay with that to replace it? Because it ain't gonna last 10 years, not, not in productivity use. In fact, it'd be based on the stuff that I saw at Artings and it's just some of my own initial stuff where it's like, ooh, I turned it on and I can kind of see some stuff. I, uh, I think that uh, two or three years is, is sort of best case scenario. And also the latest firmware update lowered the brightness from, it was like 520 nits, 510 nits, 520 nits now. It was uh, like 650 to 660 nits. So in gaming, I don't notice it as much, but I definitely noticed it in productivity. So if you have a, a darker room and the overall display is dimmer, then it's gonna last longer because the LEDs aren't putting out as much light. But if you're in a brightly lit room, not quite as good. Another downside if you're in a brightly lit room is the, the display panel itself is glossy. I don't really like that personally, but it does make the image appear to be sharper. I mean, there's a reason that Apple used glossy displays on their stuff. And it's not because it makes the display better, it's because people are just sort of naturally drawn to things that are shiny. It, it, it is sharp. So, you know, I can't, I can't fault them too much for that. Uh, but it is a, a glossy finish. So if there's stuff in your environment that would drive you crazy, then definitely can keep that in mind. 
48 inches for 4, 4K, that's a little large for me. I think 40 inches is the sweet spot for 4K if you're gonna use it for productivity. Um, I think 48 inches, you definitely notice it. On a setup like this where, you know, I'm usually uh, arm's length and a little bit away from the TV doing work here, that's completely fine. It's good for the workbenches, it's good for the camera because this type of display shows up really well on camera. It shows up really well uh, even if we're doing high speed photography. We do UFO testing and stuff like that and this is easily the best result that we've ever had in terms of chase of squares and overall latency. The actual input latency as measured by the Leo Bodnar, it's not bad, it's higher than I expected. And again, you have to turn on game mode and a bunch of other stuff in the display. There was, was one unexpected thing that happened during testing, and that is it has a sort of motion blur compensation thing, and I wasn't expecting that to be a problem on PC. But as you can see from the high speed footage, when we're running at 120 hertz, it actually does help to have that turned on. The problem is that it increases the overall latency by about four or five milliseconds, which is almost, but not quite, one frame at 120 hertz. As far as FreeSync, you know, G-Sync compatibility, um, it is G-Sync compatible, FreeSync. That's 40 hertz to 120 hertz. Um, you will have a headache though, trying to find a suitable HDMI 2.1 cable. I know this from the level one text KVM. A lot of the cables that you buy on Amazon, they're crap. And a lot of the cables that you buy on Amazon are counterfeit. So even if you get an HDMI 2.1, Visa certified, variable refresh rate, super blah, 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 it's probably crap. You're probably gonna have to order three or four or five uh, HDMI cables to try it. And it might work fine out of the box. It might even let you set, you know, 422 chroma or 444 chroma, although that's bugged in some scenarios, but we'll talk about that. But, um, and then it'll drop out and be weird. Or another symptom that I encountered was when you're playing a free sync game, occasionally you would get an inserted black frame, like it would just go black for like one frame. It's enough to notice, it was enough for me to capture it in one capture that was subsequently eaten on a memory card, but you can definitely see it happening. Switching HDMI cables, no more problem. I seem to have a little bit more trouble out of HDMI in that whole like black dropout whatever on the AMD card than the NVIDIA card. And I noticed that this also changed uh, with the NVIDIA card with newer versions of the driver. So like a couple of weeks ago, using an older NVIDIA driver, it definitely seemed like it would drop out when the uh, frame rate got around 40 FPS. Like I could notice that something not right was happening. I don't know that it was the same as the black frame insertion because I couldn't get any high speed footage to actually like slow it down so I could say what was happening, but something was definitely not right. However, later firmwares and newer drivers, I can't seem to reproduce the issue. So no B-roll of that. But um, this newer firmware does have a lower overall brightness, which is frustrating. It also means that LG giveth and LG taketh away. So, you know, are you gonna have to, it's like, okay, before I get a firmware update for this, am I gonna have to hop on forums and try to find uh, if somebody has updated the firmware and what the side effects of that are? Let's talk about pro use and color gamut and monitor testing. So as with always, we use our Spider 5 Pro and Display Cal to do our display calibration and testing. It was surprisingly good. It was 100, about 130% of the um, sRGB color space and about 97% of the Adobe RGB. Now here's where it gets interesting. This is technically an HDR display, but the overall HDR brightness was much crappier than I was expecting because this is an OLED display. There are other LCD displays that are LCD displays, not OLED, that have a better uh, overall brightness swing, even though like this has perfectly deep, rich blacks because the light is physically off. So I feel like that's a bug. That's something that's going to get fixed in a firmware update probably if enough people make enough noise. I don't recommend this display for Rec 2020. Overall, I can't recommend this display for professional use even though it is 97% Adobe sRGB because in order to get the best color accuracy out of it, you have to turn off a lot of the options in the display that make it better for things like a gaming and desktop use because if you've got all the color stuff turned on, you're definitely gonna feel like your mouse is dragging underwater. So it's, again, it's frustrating. It's like, oh, this is the price too high to pay for those wonderful blinky OLED pixels. <sighs> I mean, it's so close. It just, if it had a DisplayPort interface and I had a better controller that wasn't LG trying to muck with things to make it a better TV, like I'm sure as far as like TV goes, 
like TVs and vivid color and like movie reproduction and Blu-ray, it's probably amazing. But as a computer display, I mean, if you change all the settings, there's no denying it is amazing. But for OLED, it seems like it could be that much more amazing. But the price point is another thing you have to consider because historically OLED displays were crazy expensive. The price of this is on par with the 40 inch gaming monitors that I've been reviewing. And that's gonna be a real problem for your traditional gaming monitor companies. Um, because most people are just gonna to wanna to buy this and use it, even though it's got the inferior HDMI interface that is a huge pain in the butt in terms of cabling, that is problematic if you want to run you know, true 444 chroma, maybe in some scenarios. You might get 60 hertz and not 444. You might get 60 hertz or 120 hertz and 420. Which is still, I mean, 420, 120 hertz is not something you can do with HDMI 2.0. So clearly HDMI 2.1 is working, but it's pretty bugged. Like you're supposed to be able to get 444, like that fits within the spec, but it's bugged for me. So I don't, I mean, there's some people that report that it works and I got it to work a few times, but I don't think it was actually working correctly. So it's weird. And that's, those things have drugged this review out forever. But I've been reviewing some monitors end of year because some stuff's been on sale and a lot of people have picked up new graphics cards and we finally have graphics cards that can actually push 4K. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to unpack. Let's talk about the physical inputs on this thing, which is pretty good. We've got three HDMI ports at the side here and theoretically they can all do 120 Hertz. Only port number two is ARC slash eARC though. Keep that in mind. And for some reason, port number three on mine and one of the people here at the office also got the larger version of this using even a known good cable with a VRR 120 Hertz port three sometimes acted weird. Can't really quantify it more than that. Port three, maybe don't use that. Maybe use like port one or one of the other ports at the back. On the very back panel of the display, there's an additional a fourth HDMI 4K 120 Hertz input. Um, there's also two USB 2.0 ports for whatever devices that you might have. There's an ethernet port and there are the micro jack ports. So there are cables for doing things like component input and you know the old school stuff but you have to have a cable in order to do that for a right angle it's also possible that hdmi like if you're going to flush mount this on a wall this one hdmi port back here might be a little problematic unless you use a small thin hdmi cable but a small thin hdmi cable is going to be super problematic if you want 4k 120 hertz thankfully there's also one optical spdif port oh thank goodness Sometimes you have to use like a weird cable or like the speaker kit on some of these TVs, but no, it's just a good old standard optical SPDIF port. You can take that out into your stereo system. Oh, works perfectly. So when I say a lot of bugs, what do I mean? Well, here's one of them, 40 Hertz to four Hertz. This is what happens when you enable 12 bit color and it really is reporting that. I don't think this is an AMD driver problem. It's just bizarre. And also windows, the, the display properties thing just is like has no idea how to deal with it. Okay. Bonus round, the 4750G, this is the APU. Surprisingly, it can do 4K 120 Hertz in our ASRock Desk Mini. However, motherboard testing, the HDMI interface is not clean enough on some B550 motherboards to be able to do the full 4K 120 Hertz. And that's a 420, now 444, 8-bit, not 10-bit, not 12-bit. If you wanna run at 4K 30 Hertz or 24 Hertz, you can get eight and 10 bit color on an APU, 4750G, that's what I tested. I don't think that's gonna work on your, your older APUs, but um, it does work, or it can work, uh, but it does not work at the higher bit depths at 60 hertz on anything that I've tested. And it doesn't work at beyond 4K 60 hertz on some motherboards. Almost all of the B550 motherboards have been updated to say, well, we only support 4K 60 on the HDMI where previously they had set HDMI 2.1. I'm gonna have to put all of this in a separate video. I've also got some feelers out for AMD to find out like what the official situation is because when you run the AMD drivers, it does actually give you the dropdown to set 10 and 12 bit color at 60 Hertz. Normally that dropdown menu hides those options, but when you change them, the display frizzes out and it seems like a bad cable, but I have some known good cables. It doesn't work. It just crashes or uh, it goes back to displaying 4K 60 Hertz. So I don't know what's going on with that. And I think it's a problem, but that's gonna have to come in another video. So if you wanna see me shove the 4750G in a particular B550 motherboard that I have, 
um, let me know. I don't have the Gigabyte Vision D. I'll probably try to get it um, because a couple of B550 motherboards, I think that one included, have some sort of extra driver circuitry or something for their HDMI interface. So I wanna try that and see if that makes a difference with the APU side of things. But this uh, ASRock um, Desk Mini, the new Desk Mini, doesn't seem to have the extra HDMI driver. And I can do 4K 60 hertz, 8-bit, out of this tiny little APU, 4K 120 hertz even. Um, so, cool, an APU driving 4K 120 hertz, that's pretty bananas. Uh, but there's clearly more testing to do. Like everything, <laughs> everything in this, this display, an HDMI 2.1, oh, it dimmed. Did you see that? See, now it came back and now it's brighter. That's what it does, because you didn't move anything. To turn that off, you have to enter the service menu, probably voiding the warranty, and uh, there's no way to turn that off. In older firmwares, you could turn that off, but now you can't, because again, Icarus too close, too close to the sun, and LG was like, crap, our wings are melting, go down, 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 down. So, will this be fixed in, I don't think this is gonna get fixed with OLED. Like, my, we're entering opinion territory. I just don't think OLED is going to get this fixed in this way. I think we're going to have something else, like quantum dot LEDs or, or white LEDs that then get color shifted to the appropriate spectrum some other way, like through some sort of, you know, micro apparatus, micro lens apparatus, or some sort of <laughs> like diffraction grid or something. And uh, it ends up just converting a white LED into whatever color is needed uh, or something like that, something crazy like that. A white LED that's, well, I mean, okay, I realize that a white LED is made up of components that actually produce something that looks like white but isn't actually white, but there are um, some new promising technologies on the horizon there. I mean, there's also like quantum dot displays and stuff like that, but those are different competing technologies. OLED looks cool, seems like it's gonna be cool. This is the same kind of handle that's you know now bendable that LG is showing off at um, CES. It's like that fifth generation OLED, but again, thousand dollars basically a disposable display I don't know maybe maybe that might, that might be where we go I don't know I mean a thousand dollars is a lot to spend on a monitor that you're gonna throw away in two or three years I think personally you know for you every day using your monitor it might be like taking a trip to Disneyland with all the magic and happiness of, of doing that and so then it's worth it maybe to you depending on how much you use your computer and how much productivity you have and maybe these annoyances don't really bother you that much but there's a lot to consider here. There's a lot to unpack. I'm Little, this is level one. This has been the quickest look that I could squeeze out for the LG CX 48 inch, but this should hold true for all of the other displays as well. Um, they're really great for gaming. I mean, like playing cyberpunk and stuff like that on this display truly is an incredible experience. But if I were using this thing eight or 10 hours a day and all the other downsides, I don't know. It's definitely got its downsides. So I'm signing out. And I'll see you later. Uh, if you could pick up one of these and you want to show it off or you have experiences to share with it, come to the Level 1 forums, make a post, let us know. All right. See you there.